The collective external debt of all the governments in the world is now about $52 trillion, according to the CIA's World Factbook. Of the roughly 203 countries in the world today, only four do not owe others money. The United States alone has over $12 trillion of this debt as of January 2009. And a study authorized by the U.S. Treasury in 2001 found that in order to keep servicing the debt at its current rate of growth, by 2013, income taxes would need to be raised to 65% of one's income. The whole world is basically bankrupt. But how? How can the world as a whole owe money to itself? Obviously, it's all nonsense. The monetary system is nothing more than a game. Those in positions of social power alter the rules of the game at will. The nature of those rules are guided by the same competitive, distorted mentalities that are used to compete in everyday monetary life. Only this time the game is rigged at its root to favor those who actually run the show. For example, if you have $1 million and put it into a CD at 5% interest, you are going to generate $50,000 a year simply for that deposit. You are making money off of money itself. No invention no contribution to society, no nothing. That being denoted, if you are a lower or middle class person who is limited in funds and must use credit cards and get interest-based loans to buy your home, then you are paying interest to the bank, which the bank is then turning around and using, in theory, to pay the person's return with the 5% CD. What the bank is basically doing is stealing from the working poor to pay the leisurely rich. Simply put, the social stratification we see in the world today is maintained and guaranteed by the monetary system's underlying mechanisms. That reality aside, let's return to the subject of the so-called business cycle. When money is added to the money supply, that money is then typically put to use for some reason. Very often these reasons include starting a business, buying a home, investing in the stock market, etc. This increase in the money supply often translates into so-called economic growth and hence the boom period of the business cycle. Unfortunately, money cannot be added to the economy indefinitely, for the debt and inflation caused by the expansion will eventually overcome the growth benefits. When problems begin to arise after periods of monetary expansion, such as rising debt levels, slowing people's desire to take on new loans, the central bank and government regulators have basically two choices. They can either, one, attempt to continue the expansion by infusing even more money, often by lowering the interest rates, making credit cheaper, or two, let the contraction, hence recession, run its course, raise the interest rates, and bring the economy back to some kind of equilibrium. As far as history is concerned, the pattern has been for them to do both, basically with the idea being to ease the recession by increasing liquidity. The reasoning is simple. It is politically unpopular for the ruling class to have unemployed poor citizens. This can lead to contempt for leadership and instability. Therefore, there is always the game of placating the public with false security in order to avoid the truth coming out about the inherent dysfunctionality of the monetary system itself. The result of this easing of the contraction simply delays the inevitable, and since the U.S. government has eased virtually every contraction period since the Great Depression by infusing more money into the system, a doomsday scenario likely awaits. The big contraction. And it might be happening right now. As noted earlier, money cannot be added into the economy indefinitely, for the debt and inflation caused by the expansion will eventually overcome the growth benefits. This is what is now happening on a massive scale, and no intervention to ease this crisis is likely to work. Why? Mainly because the debt levels are way too high, the total debt of the U.S. government plus its citizens' private debt was about $53 trillion in 2007. This is simply an absurd amount of debt. The total U.S. money supply, M3, was only about $12 trillion in 2007, while the annual GDP of the U.S. was only about $14 trillion. Unfortunately, there is very little the U.S. government can do to stop this large contraction if they adhere to the tenets of the monetary system. Even with the insertion of tens of trillions of dollars, it cannot compensate for the imbalance. Plus, if they did this type of liquidity injection, the result would simply exaggerate the stagflation we are now seeing, where inflation and economic stagnation occur simultaneously. 2. The Ultimate Outsource Now, in response to these issues, very often people suggest monetary reform as the solution. 
These suggestions often include going back to the gold standard, outlawing interest, shutting down the Federal Reserve, giving the power of printing money back to the government, etc. While these reforms and others all pose logical merits to a certain degree, they do not recognize an overshadowing, little discussed phenomenon that has accelerated since the 20th century, nullifying the monetary system in and of itself. The replacement of human labor with machines. At the core of the economic system itself is the mechanism of labor for income. Our entire economic system is based on human beings selling their labor as a commodity in the open market. If humans do not have the option to work for a living, then the monetary system as we know it is over. No one can buy goods if they don't earn money. Companies cannot afford to produce if the consumer has no purchasing power to buy anything. As John Maynard Keynes disdainfully pointed out, we are being afflicted by a new disease of which some readers may not yet have heard the name, but of which they will hear a great deal in the years to come, namely technological unemployment. This means unemployment due to our discovery of means of economizing the use of labor outrunning the pace at which we find new uses for labor. While politicians, business leaders, and labor leaders bicker over issues they claim are responsible for the growing unemployment in the world, such as foreign company outsourcing or immigrant labor, the real cause is going unaddressed in the public debate, and that is technological unemployment. Since market capitalism is built upon the logic of reducing input costs to increase profits, the inclination to replace human labor whenever possible by machine automation is a natural progression of industry. After all, a machine doesn't need to take breaks, it doesn't require health insurance or benefits, and it isn't a part of a demanding labor union. A simple glance at U.S. historical labor statistics by sector shows the pattern of machine automation replacing human labor definitively. In the agricultural sector, almost all traditional workflow is now done by machine. For example, in 1949, machines did 6% of the cotton picking in the South. By 1972, 100% of the cotton picking was done by machines. In 1860, 60% of America worked in agriculture, while today it is less than 3%. When automation hit the U.S. manufacturing sector in the 1950s, 1.6 million blue-collar jobs were lost in nine years. In 1950, 33% of all U.S. workers worked in manufacturing, while by 2002, there was only 10%. The U.S. steel industry from 1982 to 2002 increased production from 77 million tons to 120 million tons, while the steel workers employed went from 289,000 to only 74,000. In 2003, a study was done of the world's largest 20 economies, ranging from the period of 1995 to 2002, finding that 31 million manufacturing jobs were lost while production actually rose by 30%. This pattern of increasing productivity and profit, coupled with decreasing employment, is a new and powerful phenomenon, with no changes in sight. So, this might beg the question, where have all those jobs gone? The service sector. From 1950 to 2002, the percentage of Americans employed in the service industries went from 59% to 82%. For the last 50 years, the service sector has been absorbing the job losses from agriculture and manufacturing. Unfortunately, this pattern is slowing fast as computerized automation takes hold there as well. From 1983 to 1993, banks cut 37% of their human tellers, and by the year 2000, 90% of all bank customers used teller machines, or ATMs. Business phone operators have almost all been replaced by computerized voice answering systems, Post office tellers are being replaced by self-service machines, while cashiers are being replaced by computerized kiosks. There isn't one area of the service industry that isn't being affected by computerized automation. Economist Stephen Roach has warned, the service sector has lost its role as America's unbridled engine of job creation. Given this reality, where is the emerging new sector to employ all of the newly displaced workers? There isn't one. And while economists struggle to create models to deal with the issue of nearly unstoppable unemployment, most refuse to consider what is really needed in order to prevent a total breakdown of society. The solution lies not in attempting to fix the issues that have emerged, but rather it is time we transcend the system in its entirety. For the system of monetary exchange, along with capitalism itself, is now completely obsolete in the wake of technological creativity. 
If people do not have jobs, they cannot support the economy by purchasing anything. This reality is the final proof that our current system is now completely out of date, and if we want to deter riots in the streets and poverty on a scale never before seen, we are going to have to revise our traditionalized notions about how society functions at the fundamental level. We require a new social system that is updated to present-day knowledge and modern methods.